Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to day five of Sankalp 2020. Welcome to the finale of the Impact Future Project launch. I am Amit Bhatia, founder of Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle. And for one final time, hosting this last edition of a 30 minutes plenary on Impact Future. We have saved the best for the last. As we talk about future, I cannot help but evoke the author of The Future of Man, Victor Hugo, the French novelist who famously said, nothing in the world is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. So today, let's talk about time. On a September morning in 1504, Peter Henlin, a German locksmith, was involved in a brawl where his fellow veteran locksmith, George Glazer, is killed. He leaves his hometown in Nuremberg, Germany for four years to take an asylum in a monastery where he hones his skills of clock making. In 1505, he invents the world's first watch, a fire gilded pomander. Peter Henlin had the vision, artistic skill and craftsmanship to make a timepiece that was wearable on the body for the very first time. This Renaissance development was a new step beyond the simple miniaturization of table clocks. The idea existed already, and he transformed this idea into a robotic invention, made it wearable and personalized technology. Upon his ingress back in Nuremberg, he was quickly realized as a master locksmith due to his ability to create small spring powered brass clock, which were then very rare and expensive. With his ever-increasing popularity, local and distant nobility alike called upon his services, demanding more dazzling, more exquisite, smaller clock design. Although our definition of portable today makes us think of wrist watches and smartphone, in those times, portable watches had to be worn as a pendant due to their sheer size. Peter Henlein is regarded as the father of the modern clock. It is fascinating to think that the genesis of robotics and miniaturization started 500 years ago in a monastery during Renaissance. Today, in our 30 minutes on Impact Future, we have five more inspiring leaders running against the clock, against time to deliver gender justice, economic justice, educational justice, and social justice. They are restoring balance to a clock so out of sync as peaceful missionaries of an impact renaissance. Let's start with one of my role models, the Padma Shri award-winning executive director of Seva, Reema Nanavati. Reema Ben has been working with Seva since 1984, was elected as the general secretary in 1999, expanded membership to make Seva the single largest union of informal sector workers. Rima Ben oversees 3,200 self-help groups, 110 cooperatives, 15 federations, and 1.9 million women members. She shows every day how impact is God's work. She is the very worthy successor to Seva founder Ila Ben Bhatt. Rima Ben is also co-chair of IFP's Gender Equality Women and Livelihoods Community, a friend, philosopher, and guide. Please welcome Reema Nanavati. Namaste. The Impact Future project is here. Timely, important. Most lucrative investment of the Impact Future project in terms of returns and duration is in what we call the economy of nurturance economy that creates jobs for poor women and workers economy that does not displace jobs or skills but adds and builds on existing jobs and skills economy that does not plunder natural resources but in fact nourishes mother nature tree water air land what we need in impact investing is recovery and resilience fund for women-owned enterprises. What we need is national impact missions that will set direction and pace for investments in building economy of nurturance. 
I want to elaborate the concept of economy of nurturance. I must say that the primary objective of microfinance envisaged in the early days was development to remove poverty and hunger and sustain peace. That vision for us is not changed today. That is what we call it today, building an economy of nurturance. Therefore, in contrast to finance in general, in the larger context, the economy of microfinance is an economy of nurturance of its clients, nurturance of their health, their work and skill, of their family and community. Today we have women leaders in microfinance at all levels. In the area of microfinance, women leaders have emerged in sizable numbers. They have learned from their work. They have performed well. In these women leaders, we therefore have a powerful tool which has a direct link to economics. How can we wield this tool? for nurturance of the poor, working women for nurturance of not only her, but also of her family, her society, her community, her village, and thereby of the universe. What we are saying is building a nurturing economy when our rural subsistence economy is getting eroded and depriving the poor of their basic needs. The movement of microfinance and SHGs has grown, the numbers increased. Yet, we wonder today, has the impact been what could have been? Have the lives and livelihoods of women they serve changed to the extent it could and should have been? Why do we find, to use an analogy for, from corporate world, a glass ceiling and also a glass wall? that hampers not only upward growth, but also horizontal development. At this conference, we have to think together and understand that it is not enough that we lend money or invest in equity. We must invest or lend with nurturance of our micro client herself, her human environment, that is her family and community, as well as her ecological environment. We are not looking at growth by leaps and bounds, but growth that is the outcome of nurturance. It is not enough that we give loans or equity. We must examine what is the end result of investment we do. How do they influence the world around the micro person we set out to serve? If she lives in a district where migration in search of livelihood is a big concern over the years, how have women's financial services helped to mitigate the forced migration or at least reduced it? So in the way of the nurturing our local to global economy that grows not at the cost of others because that is not development. We will find business opportunities in uncharted areas. We'll find ways to make tree plantation more profitable than cutting forests, recycling more profitable than new manufacturing. We must try to make this possible. This is the economy of nurturance. Look at the possibility of turning things around to see what a women-led economy would look like. In our experience, where women are leaders, their work is likely to structure around stability and the well-being of the family and her community. Their economic activity is likely to be diverse, many-fold, minimizing risk and maximizing sustainability. This does not mean an end to industry, mechanization, or global trade. Rather, it is the scale, the nature, and the scope of our economic structures that will have to change if the key actors are women. It is time we explore the potential of local sustainable structures, and it is time 
women took leadership in building them. Let us begin building towards an economy of nurturance. This is what the Impact Future Project stands for. Thank you. Thank you, Reema Ben. Our second speaker is another friend from my Aspen Institute world, Sean Hinton, CEO of Soros Economic Development Fund and co-director of their economic justice program. Prior to being the CEO, Sean Hinton consulted in China, Mongolia, and Africa, was a longtime senior advisor to Goldman Sachs and Rio Tinto Group, and spent years in McKinsey as a consultant. He's as comfortable in his investment role in London as he was as a shepherd in Mongolia. Sean has been an impact investor in India too, and truly evangelizes the idea of economic justice. Please welcome Sean Hinton. It's a great honor to be asked to contribute to, uh, to this discussion. And although these comments come from a long way away, uh, and uh, I don't have the benefit of being with you all, and we don't have the opportunity to sort of discuss and listen to one another, and, uh, and I'm not really grounded in the, all the context of where you are, I hope that these uh, comments are useful for, uh, for, for the discussion. Impact investing, it seems to me, requires us to take something that's already really difficult and make it even harder. Investing successfully and sustainably and responsibly in this economic environment and in the context of India where you are now is hard. But this community sees the huge inequities and challenges of the climate emergency. And because of the values we share and the needs we see and the opportunities we identify that maybe others don't, this community are people who are prepared to tackle the much harder task of investing in ways that accomplish real impact and not just a financial return. And as we look at these challenges and as uh, we think about how we can respond uh, with the means that we have and the, the capacities we have to the global pandemic and the climate crisis, and we think about how to use our investment capital to address these, we've been focused more and more on thinking about work and thinking about women. Work that is not just a means to an economic benefit, but work that contributes to developing human potential and social justice. And work that engages the entire population and removes barriers to the systematic exclusion of women from uh, the, work, uh, the work environment. There is a huge opportunity to build back better at this moment. And there are two things I thought might be useful to contribute to the, to the conversation. The first is that more than 2 billion people in the world, more than 61% of the employed population, make their living in the informal economy, often via multiple livelihoods. That reality is all around us, everywhere in the world and nowhere more than in India. This is a huge problem, of course, because our economics and our investment thinking essentially ignores informality because most of the work in the informal economy is done by women. This means we radically fail to engage the potential of women in addressing the huge range of social and environmental issues that we seek to address. The second is that while there are many barriers to women's participation in the economy around the world, over 50% of women in low and middle income countries are unable to participate in the labor force primarily due to the burden of unpaid care work. What we might call the care economy is more than 11% of global employment. Most of the jobs in the sector are held by women and most of those are unpaid or in positions that are poorly paid, insecure, and often considered to be low status. And this is not just a problem in the global south, of course, unpaid care work in the US alone accounts for $11 trillion a year or 9% of global GDP. So to address a problem of this size and complexity, we have to think out of the box. And this is where I think 
the impact future community comes in, as there is a huge opportunity for India to show the rest of the world the way forward. We, in our own work, are keen to find partners to invest in and support the informal work that women do around the world and remove barriers to female participation in the workforce. This looks like, we think, investing in supporting platforms that formalize and support informal workers and advance their rights, and also investing in companies that provide labor-saving technologies and services that are targeted at women's needs like childcare. We've identified these approaches as amongst the most high priority targets for our work, and we would welcome the opportunity to participate and engage with others in this uh, community who are interested uh, in, in, in these areas as well. All in all, the care economy is a huge, underserved and vitally important sector, and we're excited to be experimenting and innovating in ways to invest in it. And we really hope the Impact Future community that's focused on promoting the rights and opportunities for women can consider this in its work. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. After gender justice and economic justice, our third speaker epitomizes educational justice. Safina Hussain is founder and CEO of Educate Girls, a former London School of Economics graduate and has worked extensively with rural and urban underserved communities in South America, Africa, and Asia. Safina's effort to bridge the gender gap in education in India have been widely recognized by Niti Aayog, British Asian Trust, Skoll Award, and most recently by the Audacious Project. As a pioneer of the development impact bond in India, she has won a significant grant to continue her work at scale. Please welcome Safina Hussain. Namaste everyone. I am Safina Hussain and I'm the founder of Educate Girls. It's a nonprofit that has grown from 50 schools in 2007 to working in almost 18,000 villages today. Since our inception, we have grown to a full-time team of over 1,700 employees, plus 13,000 Team Balika volunteers at a village level. And together with the government and the community and our volunteers, uh, we have helped to enroll over 750,000 out-of-school girls and improved learning outcomes for 1.3 million children to date. First question, why girls' education? The World Bank says that girls' education is one of the best investments that a country can make. It helps to directly improve nine of the 17 sustainable development goals. Everything from health, nutrition, employability, poverty alleviation, even climate change. All of these are positively impacted when girls come into school and complete their education. Finally, it is a problem we only have to solve once because an educated mother is 200% more likely to educate her children. And with that, we can close the gender and illiteracy gap forever. So with such a transformative proposition, why are girls out of school? In India alone, we still have over 4 million girls amongst the highest in the world. And as we see it, there are two key issues at play. The two Ps, I call them, poverty and patriarchy. And because both of these, I'll say that again, both of these are at the root cause of systemic discrimination of girls. So if the problem with the two Ps, then what does Educate Girls do to solve this particular problem? We work in some of the most rural, remote, and tribal areas, and we go door to door. We knock on every single door to find girls who are not going to school, and then work with the community to bring them back into school, make sure they're staying and learning. And all of this is done through a village-based volunteer called Team Malika. And we know that our model works because a recent randomized control evaluation over a three-year period said that Educate Girls was able to bring back 92% of all out-of-school girls. And in terms of learning, our children gained an additional year of schooling compared to the average student. So we have a model that's scalable because we're already functioning in 18,000 villages. We know it's smart because we use a lot of data and technology. 
We know it's sustainable and systemic because A, we work in partnership with the community and the model is run by the community and also in partnership with the government to make sure that there's no creation of a parallel delivery system. So with that, we built ourselves a really audacious goal. Our ambition in the next five years is to bring back 1.5 million out of school girls back into school. And then the pandemic hit. COVID-19 makes the issue of girls' education even more dire because it directly impacts the two P's, poverty and patriarchy. Globally, they're estimating that a minimum of half a million young girls will be forced into child marriage this year rather than coming back to school. Past data from pandemics like Ebola in Africa suggests that out-of-school girls' numbers may triple. They did so in Africa from 7 to almost 21%. So the pandemic is not only a health crisis, economic factors are crippling communities, schools are shut, and families are losing out on work and at home. There is also an emerging regression to all the old gendered roles in the households. We're seeing domestic duties falling straight back onto the shoulders of our young girls. So I believe that to tackle the two Ps, we need the three Rs, which is relief, recovery, and to reimagine. In terms of relief, we first started with hunger because we know that even during normal times, our girls are some of the last ones to eat in the house. So we did doorstep delivery of rations to almost half a million individuals. To recover, we're doing two things. One is identifying and making sure that we're contacting all out of school children, especially the migrant children who've come back and make sure that we know who they are and where they are so that we can connect them when the schools reopen. And secondly, we're bringing learning to the children through community-based uh, camps wherever possible so that they don't disappear and, and they are in touch with us. But COVID-19 has also made visible several opportunities. And I believe that these will be important uh, to help us reimagine a new path. With the increased use of technology, we can do just-in-time training. We can also do it remotely. We're using Zoom and Google Classroom and lots of tools. So should we just reimagine the future of education and skilling from the lens of technology adoption? So before we can get carried away with data and technology and AI, I believe that we have to remain alert to concerns that too much technology and too much standardization can become reductive. With a modular approach, um, will we make education too skills focused, too short term, too transactional and not holistic? With such a reliance upon digitization, will it lead to more polarization? With too much focus on narrow... Sh My biggest concern is the risk of a deepening digital divide between the haves and the have-nots. So how should we approach reimagining the future of skills and education? Should we be fighting tech? We have to be sure that we're not coming to the table kicking and screaming that all tech is bad and you can't replace humans and you can't replace teachers with machines. Equally, I believe that we have to make sure that we do not reimagine education with too much enthusiasm for tech, assuming that technology and artificial intelligence will solve all our problems and be the future of education. Instead, we need to reimagine with deep thoughtfulness seeing the positive opportunities that tech offers, but also being aware of the pitfalls and ensuring that Education 2.0 is at its heart inclusive, holistic, and equitable. And for that, we must put our most vulnerable at the center of everything that we reimagine and rebuild. I hope that Aspire Impact Future Project helps to identify and build such bold impact ideas in education, skills, and ed tech that address the most pertinent question of what's needed for the future of our country and our society. My hope is that through this initiative, we'll emerge unicorns that can touch a billion lives, reaching the most vulnerable and creating a civilized and equitable future for us all. I am Safina Hussain, and I educate girls. Thank you. Thank you, Safina. Our full speaker today is Pradeep Nair, Ford Foundation's Regional Director for India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. 
Pradeep has over 25 years of global experience in technology, consulting, and investing. He started in Silicon Valley as a big five management consultant building software application products. After working on prolific projects with President Clinton, Mayor Bloomberg, and Paul Walker, he's at home as an impact advocate solving societal problems. Pradeep is a fellow of Aspire Circle and a leader in IFP's Gender Equality Women and Livelihoods community. Please welcome Pradeep Nair. So these sessions are virtual. I would still urge all of you to reach out to as many people as you can. Take advantage of this format in a way. I know I will. As far as uh, the financial inclusion and fintech program under IFP, even though most of the work will be done amongst the partners that will be a part of this uh, vertical, uh, I'm sure we'll still find some ways we'll put in place some process and procedures to enable us to tap into the wealth of knowledge and experience out there. There are models, like I stated earlier, that some of us are familiar with and that we are testing out. But um, I'm very curious to know if there are certain models out there that we are not aware of yet that may or may not work. As a foundation and as, um, and I'm sure my uh, uh, friends and colleagues in this vertical will also agree, we're always looking for new ideas and we're willing to test them. Obviously the ones that uh, we have success with and we feel can address these main issues of credit worthiness and accessibility are the ones that we might invest in and double down. But even the others um, are, are important to us because uh, there might be certain regions in the country for which a particular model makes more sense than the other. Once again, thank you so much for this opportunity to share my ideas and thoughts. We do welcome as many ideas, both for the overall IFP program and for the vertical of FinTech and financial inclusion. I wish you all the best and look forward to seeing you all in the virtual meetings. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, Pradeep. Our last speaker for the day and the week is Cliff Pryor, CEO of GSG. We started the week with Sir Ronald Cohen, Chair of GSG, and we end the week with Cliff Pryor, CEO of GSG, as he truly catalyzes impact investment and entrepreneurship around the world with 33 and growing country members. Previously, Cliff was CEO of Big Society Capital, the UK's wholesaler for social impact investment and CEO of Unlimited. I've known Cliff for many years. He's a true people leader understands both impact entrepreneurship and impact investing intimately and is the ideal person to lead this apex organization and the global impact movement. Please welcome Cliff Pryor. Hello, I'm Cliff Pryor, CEO of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, a growing movement across already 33 countries, including the India National Advisory Board, catalyzing impact investment and enterprise to benefit all people and our planet. Our aim is that measurable impact is embraced as a deliberate driver in every investment, government and business decision. Impact investing is an exciting, a rapidly growing industry, determined to generate social and environmental impact as well as financial returns, taking place all over the world uh, and all kinds of investments, companies and governments. We are seeing rapid uh, progress on impact, expecting the first trillion dollars in impact investment by the end of this year. But of course, COVID has hit hard across almost every country. The health emergency, creating economic chaos with the greatest harm hitting people on low incomes and insecure jobs. So we must make sure that COVID is, is, uh, becomes a turning point towards a more inclusive and, uh, and impactful economy. The GSG, believes that the time is now for a just and impact-led recovery to benefit all people and our planet. And we're not alone in this. Uh, at our recent uh, summit, global leader after global leader stood up and for this just and impact-led recovery, over 600 people signed up for our leader's declaration for a just and sustainable future. 80 of them globally recognized figures in their fields. 
And Georgieva Kristalina, boss of the Inter in, uh, International Monetary Fund, said that financial stability will depend on environmental and social uh, sustainability in the post-COVID world. As we are hearing from major corporate leaders and heads of global asset managers, impact is in the boardroom. It's being discussed and now it's time to build the road to use it. So we need to remove the roadblocks along the way, getting understanding in governments, switching negative and environmentally damaging uh, subsidies towards positive so social and sustainable policies, improving the regulatory regimes. These are all underway in so many countries now. And getting clarity on impact itself, there's growing coherence around impact standards and reporting systems led by the outstanding work of the impact management project. The combination of assessing risk, return and impact is becoming more and more common amongst asset owners, asset managers, corporates. Uh, it, in, in America and Europe, it's, it's becoming uh, the norm quite rapidly, spreading across continents as the value of this triple bottom line is recognized, particularly in how companies and investors see the need for greater resilience uh, as environmental health and social shocks come faster each year. Impact investing has some of the most useful tools in the post-COVID crisis. Social outcome funds for reskilling people uh, as the uh, economy revives and for rebuilding education and health systems. Early stage investing for SME businesses, the tech for good movement, accelerating new ideas for successful impact companies. Here at the GSG, we're also working on transparency. What your fund, your company uh, are doing on social and environmental factors uh, and through the impact weighted accounting initiative, turning those fact, uh, factors into financial um, figures which go into your profit and loss account. The world is pushing ever harder for transparency. We've all seen how shareholders are voting, how customers are demanding to know what is in your company and in its value chain. But this shouldn't be seen as a burden for companies and fund managers. It's a positive opportunity. The biggest future growth sectors globally are impact sectors, health, education, homes, environment, food, agriculture. The COVID crisis has caused immense damage, health and economic, and some business sectors have collapsed. But out of crises come the new ideas, the new entrepreneurs, the new opportunities for companies. And it will be, uh, it will be entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial companies who create the social and sustainable future based out of this crisis. India is so well placed uh, with a young, educated, entrepreneurial population already strong on the digital transformation, then the genomic revolution coming, the food revolution, the zero carbon revolution, with a domestic population crying out for these developments and a country which is going ever more significant globally. Impact is your chance, your opportunity. Impact is for you, for your families. Impact is for your companies, for your better world. Impact is for your India. Thank you, Sankalp, for this opportunity. Thank you, Cliff. All good things come to an end, as does our time. This past week, it was a privilege to spend 30 minutes with you every day, bringing to you world's leading impact actors and ideas for our shared impact future. For us at Aspire Impact and Aspire Circle, this is a long journey to justice with 300 leaders who have signed up to ensure India embraces impact capitalism and then takes it to the world. We hope you will stay engaged with the Impact Future Project and support us as together and only together we can co-create a global impact renaissance. Thank you. <laughs>